guys and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to be talking all about the vagus nerve. This is the house of rest and digest. This is critically important if you've ever been diagnosed with IBS, Crohn's, colitis, SIBO, GERD, or for that matter, any other GI condition. This is such an important nerve that you need to know about. Stay tuned if you want to learn more about what the vagus nerve is, what it does, why it's so important, and how we can get it to function even better. All right, so per our usual on this channel, let's get a little bit of background information and catch you up to speed on what the vagus nerve is and what it does. Because we can't really talk about how to improve something if we don't know a lot about what it is and what it does, right? So let's get going with that background info. Recall, if you will, we've got your digestive system, everything from your esophagus down to your anus and everything in between. And then here we have the central nervous system. So we've got your brain, your cortex. This is the part of your nervous system that's listening to me, taking in the information, storing some of it away from memory, and figuring out how to apply it to your life. Your cerebellum is largely in control of coordination and planning of movement. And then we have our brainstem, and there's three different parts, but you've got your brainstem right here, and then this would continue down into the spinal cord, but that's a bit less relevant for the conversation we're having today. So recall from the gut-brain axis video, if you will, that there are vagal nerve nuclei that live in the bottom part of the brainstem. And you can think of this as where the neurons live and kind of like their house. So if you imagine a neuron as having a cell body like any other cell, and this is gonna have a nucleus with all the DNA and lots of organelles, things like mitochondria and ribosomes, all of those things that we learned about in 10th grade biology class. Nerves are gonna have a long axon and that's where the signal is transmitted. So when they're trying to communicate with another neuron or a muscle, that signal is gonna go down this long axon, which can be anywhere from nanometers up to perhaps a meter in length. Some of these nerve fibers are very, very long. And when we look at a nerve, like in a dissection class or an anatomy book, we're generally looking at bundles of these axons that are traveling to their final destination. So we've got the cell body with some little like tentacle kind of guys here, dendrites that help it communicate with other neurons, the long axon where that signal is going to be transmitted, and then it's going to terminate or innervate something on the other side. So this might be another neuron. So we might have a neuron like this. So here's all its dendrites and its nucleus. So maybe it goes like that with another neuron. Maybe it's synapsing on a muscle. It's upper grabs, but this is the general layout of the nervous system. And you can imagine where there are clumps of nerve bodies, that is gonna be a nucleus. So for the vagus nerve, its nucleus is going to live in the brainstem itself. And it's gonna get signals from higher up, like in the brain and the cerebellum. But these vagal nerve nuclei are the first part of the vagus nerve. Remember, the nerve itself, when you see it drawn out or people talking about it and all the different fibers, you're looking at a big bundle of axons, which are very important, but it's not the whole story. So we have the cell bodies living in these nuclei, and then that nerve is going to travel and make its way down to your gut. So it's gonna travel out the base of your skull, down through your neck, and then innervate or synapse with everything. So everything from the back of your throat, your esophagus, your heart, your lungs, your spleen, liver, gallbladder, kidneys, intestines, small intestine, a big chunk of the colon, aka large intestine, stomach if I didn't mention that already. I mean anything from here to here pretty much is going to be providing, it's going to be getting juice, it's going to be getting stimulation from the vagus nerve. So that's in a nutshell, it starts up in the brainstem and then it goes down into the gut. And remember that neurons get signals from other neurons typically. So even though we're focusing on that neuron or those nuclei, somebody had to tell it what to do. So a lot of the information going to these vagal nerve nuclei is gonna come from neurons that live up here. So things like memories or sensory stimuli like touch and scent and movement things like movement and its stimuli coming from the cerebellum, because there's a lot of cerebellar projections, the centers of your brain that regulate emotion and the trauma response and that autonomic nervous system, all of this feeds into 
the vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve is part of that autonomic system, that automatic, totally unconscious part of your nervous system that is ready to defend you, ready to protect you or serve you at a moment's notice, and it does so completely without thanks and completely under the background of your conscious mind. So it's pretty freaking cool. But the rest of the nervous system does influence the vagus nerve, and this is what's so cool. So right now, if I asked you to, like say right now, activate your vagus nerve now, you can't do it, can you? You cannot, I can't. Because again, this nerve is not under conscious control. We cannot force it to do what we want. We cannot think our way through. We can't use logic. We can't use academic learning and that big, you know, conscious part of our brain. We cannot use our cortex to boss around the autonomic nervous system. But it is going to influence it. So when we get into the conversation of how to stimulate your vagus nerve or how to get it to work better, we could use the power of our thoughts and our actions and things like breath work, voluntary muscle control, we could use things like that to tap into the vagus nerve. But this is not something that you are going to will into submission or force into doing something. You can't just like gargle for 10 minutes a day and force the vagus nerve to work and think that that's gonna be really tremendously therapeutic. Nonetheless, let's get into what this nerve does, because I think that's an important conversation to have also. So remember, the nerve starts out in the brainstem and then goes down into the guts and it's going to form connections or synapses with all of your digestive organs and it's going to tell them what to do. So in the level, you know, if you think all the way through the path that the food would take, starting in the throat and the esophagus, the vagus nerve is largely in control of motility, contracting the esophagus and sending food through the throat down into the stomach. When you get to that sphincter that closes off the stomach and keeps the stomach contents inside and prevents acid reflux, that sphincter, that lower esophageal sphincter, is very much regulated or influenced by vagal nerve tone. So that's why this is really important for people with GERD or reflux, because that sphincter is almost always the culprit in true acid reflux, especially with esophagitis. You've got to think that that sphincter needs a little bit of TLC or better tone. And the way that you do that is by tapping into the vagus nerve. Moving down into the stomach, I know a lot of people on this channel have watched my videos on low stomach acid, and I get a lot of questions about how you can start to make digestive juices or make stomach acid naturally. Vagus nerve. That is the nerve that is coming down synapsing with the stomach and telling the stomach to make things like digestive enzymes and HCL and maybe secrete mucus. So it's a pretty important thing for the stomach. And if you want to have good stomach emptying, which is a variation of motility, if you think of it that way, if you want to have good stomach emptying or motility or contractility, or if you want to make enough juices and enzymes and HCL, that's all vagus nerve. So this is very important also with people who have delayed stomach emptying or gastroparesis. This is hugely important for them. Moving down into the small intestine, now we start getting into the territory of what might be affected in conditions like celiac disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and SIBO. If you want to have a good migrating motor complex and you want to shoo all that excess bacteria out of the small bowel and keep it down into the colon, that's all vagus nerve. You've got to have a good healthy vagus nerve if you want to have good functioning MMC and motility function in the small bowel. And this is one really big window of opportunity for people with IBS and SIBO that I find gets either ignored entirely or just not talked about correctly or enough in even conventional medicine or functional medicine. I find that that's a very, very big gaping hole in the world of IBS and SIBO. Moving through, we get to the colon. Well, the colon, the first part of it at least, is also innervated by the vagus nerve. And if you want to be able to move stool through your system at an appropriate pace and not have constipation or diarrhea, again, this harkens back to vagal nerve control and tone. So this is very important for people with inflammatory bowel disease, constipation, diarrhea, and things like bloating. Because remember, bloating largely is going to be trapped gas or food that's not moving through the system at an even appropriate pace. 
So if you have dysmotility that's leading to bloating or poor motility that's leading to constipation or diarrhea, this is the nerve that you need to work on. This is so critically important. And even if you think of the, the so-called accessory organs of digestion, the pancreas and all of its digestive juices get their memo from the vagus nerve. So if you have been diagnosed with low pancreatic enzyme function, or if you feel like you're stuck taking digestive enzymes all day every day, you might need better vagal nerve tone. Similarly, the liver, the liver is constantly detoxifying things for you and its immune system is trying to protect you from things like bacterial toxins and LPS. And it's the liver that also gets a lot of stimuli from the vagus nerve and the gallbladder. All of these organs from here to here are covered by the vagal nerve and we need it to be happy and healthy and functioning if we want to stand a chance at having good healthy digestion and good healthy poops and no, not a lot of bloating and proper enzyme production. But I saved my personal favorite for last. The last thing that the vagus nerve does that I think is so freaking cool and I wanna share with you guys is it is in and of itself anti-inflammatory. So if you think conditions like Crohn's, colitis, gastritis, esophagitis, SIBO, certainly leaky gut, all of these conditions have some level of inflammation in and around the digestive organs, right? And that inflammation can manifest in different ways for different people, but any of these diagnoses are correlated with some level of low-lying or moderate levels of inflammation. Well, vagal nerve synapsing and vagal nerve activity is intrinsically anti-inflammatory. There's been studies that show that when these synapses fire off and they're working appropriately, they can dampen or lower inflammation in the liver or the stomach or the gallbladder or whatever tissue target you're talking about. And this is hugely important, not only from the inflammation standpoint, but also immune function. Your immune system is not gonna work appropriately if it's constantly pissed off and inflamed. Well, if you want to dampen that inflammation and help the immune system take a deep breath and take a chill pill, the vagus nerve is your ticket to doing that to a large degree. Now, there's communication between the gut and the vagus nerve. It's not all top-down command, right? About 80% of the vagus nerve is actually going this direction. It's sensory. So we're up until this point, we have been talking about the motor portion of the vagus nerve. We've been talking about how when it fires off, it influences the gut. But about 80% of these vagal nerve fibers are sensory in nature. They are bringing information and metabolites back up to the brain and the nervous system. So we can't ignore things like dysbiosis, candida, bacterial overgrowth, we can't ignore things like leaky gut and LPS exposure and endotoxemia because ultimately that stuff is going to influence the vagus nerve directly and possibly higher up brain centers. And of course, in their typical fashion, conventional medicine, it's almost laughable. There are studies now, for example, with Parkinson's where they say, okay, we think that LPS and bacterial toxins and inflammatory mediators are coming up the vagus nerve and affecting the nervous system from the gut. So what is their solution? We'll just cut that nerve. Vagotomy. Boom. Problem solved. And they've shown in mouse models at least that this does help prevent Parkinson's disease. But at what cost? We can't be going around and chopping out people's vagus nerve or vagal nerves rather and think that that's gonna be therapeutic or smart or safe. So I think it's proving the hypothesis that the vagus nerve is bringing stuff up to the nervous system and stimulating the nervous system or generating inflammation for people who have gut dysbi dysbiosis or dysfunction. But the answer is not to cut the nerve and sever that connection between your brain and your gut. Similarly, I've seen more and more research now that they're trying to stimulate the vagus nerve with an implant. There are implants now that go alongside your carotid artery in your neck and they will stimulate and facilitate vagal nerve tone. Well, who in their right mind wants to volunteer for a surgery where they put a nerve stimulating device in your freaking neck? That, that's missing the boat. And even if we can stimulate this nerve and try to force it to work better, what is that gonna do if you have wicked dysbiosis? 
or leaky gut or inflammation, or if you have neural inflammation, if you've had things like a concussion, like what are we really going to accomplish by putting an implant in your neck and then forcing the vagus nerve to work better? I don't really know. I don't think that's very safe or very wise either. You're much better off trying to tap into the vagus nerve from a holistic perspective, try to get it to work better and gently, gradually get it to a place where it could be happy and healthy and functional rather than us trying to force it to do our bidding. That's not really how the body works. And probably a lot of you have experienced this. When you try to force the body to do something that it doesn't want to do, it tends to get kind of pissed, right? Like you get all these other wacky side effects, all these other diseases, because you're trying to force the body into doing something that it frankly doesn't want to do. So if you take anything away from this video, I hope that it's A, that the vagus nerve is super duper ultra mega important, particularly for gut health, but probably for body-wide health as well. And also that you cannot force this nerve to do your bidding. You can't force it to work. You can't outthink or outsmart this nerve. You can't use your thinking smarty pants brain and book learning or YouTube learning in this case to outfox this nerve. What we have to do is we have to create an environment that would make for a happy, healthy, functioning vagus nerve. We're gonna talk about that in the next video. Thank you so much for tuning in and I can't wait to share my top 10 tricks for actually stimulating your vagus nerve. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.